Okay, be honest with me. How many times have you as a sports fan sat in your living room or in the stands and called the game for yourself? either out loud or with your friends or just in your own mind thinking, what would I say about the first pitch of the first game of the World Series? Or maybe just the first game of the season, which is what we're all waiting for right now. Well, today I have the extreme pleasure of introducing you to one such voice. For her, it's not just the dream job, it's her real job. Melanie Newman has done just about everything in the sports world and now she can add one more media credential to her collection that says, play-by-play -play voice, Baltimore Orioles. Today she's here with me to tell some of those stories and hopefully give us all a little advice on landing the dream job. What's up everybody, Tara Wellman here. Welcome back to my little corner of the internet. Thank you so much for stopping by. This is a place where you and I get to connect around stories and people and places and ideas kind of tied together with a common thread of sports, because that's what I love. Presumably, you love it too. Or maybe you just love me, and if that's the case, you are a gem. Make sure that if that is the case, and you like me or the content, you hit that like button and subscribe to this channel for more content pretty much every week. Now, another person super excited to get baseball back underway is Melanie Newman. As I mentioned, she has recently joined the team covering the Baltimore Orioles. She got to call a spring training game. She'll be on air as a play-by-play -play voice and other things for the Baltimore Orioles broadcast team throughout whatever we get of a summer of baseball in 2020. And I am thrilled to introduce her or perhaps reintroduce her to you today. So let's get to it. Melanie, this is the first time we've had a chance to actually talk, but you're one of those people that I kind of feel like I know because of the internet. So nice to actually meet you in person and thank you for hanging out for a little bit today. No, I, I totally agree with that. And it's funny because we talk about it all the time, like some of our closest friends, we haven't actually met in person. And I feel like <laughs> no one outside of our industry actually gets that. Um, but I really agree. Like from, from the moment that we connected on Twitter, I was like, this is one of my people. Like we get each other. We're very similar Again, like even though we're just now meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy how the internet is such a terrifying place sometimes, but it's also where these really cool connections are made. And I think in an industry like ours, it's so valuable, right? When connections and networking are what get you from one step to the next. And we can talk more about that as we go along. But yeah, it's great to not only meet people that understand your sports obsession, but also the crazy behind the scenes, pull the curtains back on this industry that most people um, have never had to stop and think about. So it's great to have a chance to chat with you. And I want to know a little bit of all the things, your journey to where you are now, but let's just kind of put it out there to start with. You have, well, before you know, a hundred years ago, before the world stopped spinning this summer, you were able to kind of announce that you had landed your dream job. And that's such a cool piece of someone's story to be able to tell, to be able to watch. And I want to know, you know, as we go throughout this, what that has been like, but how cool is it just to start with to say that you get to call games for the Baltimore Orioles? It's more than I could have imagined, um, especially when you look at the landscape. And obviously, it's changing and it's progressing with not only the roles that are out there, but the people who qualify for those roles. Um, we finally have started taking off the masks of things that shouldn't have been qualifiers in the first place. So we are seeing more women, more minorities, more diversity when it comes to what the broadcaster looks like. Um, but when it came to what they did, it was, it was usually very, you know, there's this one box for in the booth and there's this one box for sideline reporters and you know, so on. So when Baltimore and I first started sitting down and I said, look, I've, I've loved being a team player in minor league baseball over the years. I've loved honestly doing a little bit of everything because it gives you that chance to be really plugged into the game and not just in your one little lane. And, and you know, you kind of forget what everything else that what all goes into making the sport happen. Um, they were very receptive to that and they loved it. And so when it came back to me that, look, we actually are going to put you in the booth um, and calling games on the radio with Jeff Arnold, but we're also going to have you 50, 50 uh, on the sidelines for television. Um, it blew my mind. You know, I, I didn't even think that that was really a possibility. And then finding out in the past, people would always ask, well, you have to pick one. So which one is it going to be? 
and now I don't have to pick one. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, there, it was a no brainer, you know, that, that was where I knew that was time for me. This was, this was my new home to come to and to join. And there wasn't really anything to think about it. Um, you always think of which organization maybe you'll end up with. And, and I've been with four at this point, which I'm very lucky for, but there's, there's zero doubt in my mind that Baltimore is where I'm supposed to be. Such a cool moment and, and feeling of like, okay, this is why I stuck it out, I'm sure. But let's kind of go back through that process a little bit because anyone in any industry, you know, when you get to that dream job, when you get to the goal you've been working towards, that's great. But it wasn't a straight line to get there. And there were probably a lot of, a lot of speed bumps, if not like giant mountains that you had to cross to get to that point. So what started all of this for you? Why? broadcasting, why sports, why pursue this in the first place? So sports were a huge part of our family growing up. Um, that was, that was how we spent time together living in Atlanta. We were in the heart of, you know, SEC football. We had the Braves who were just perennial winners. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot lacking when it came to sports in the South and, and Atlanta had the Olympics in 96. I was mm. five years old and, and I still remember, I mean, running, all over Georgia, basically, to go to all these different events with my family. Um, and as much as my dad loved football and was a football man, and, and I later found out it was actually the 94th strike was the reason why he was so quiet when it came to baseball, um, I, I still was attracted to the game. I loved the game. I, I wanted to know all of the little intricacies, the ins and outs. For whatever reason, it just it made the most sense to me. It, it stuck its claws in more than any of the other sports that we had been a part of, and having not inherited a single athletic gene in my body, um, I took advantage of the fact that, you know, I had a photographic memory that I liked to study, that I, I was an avid reader. And having East Cobb baseball 10 minutes from the house meant all of my friends played the game year round. Um, and, and that was most of my friends were guys. You know, I never really found my place when I was a kid. I wasn't the girly girl, but I wasn't a full blown tomboy. So trying to find that in between was hard. And I found that at the ballpark. Um, and just going and watching and, and asking questions and then growing into a community that kind of made a place for me as well. That was one of my first summer jobs was working overflow games. Um, and that was everything from, you know, scooping water off of the field because it didn't drain to the one game that they let me for whatever reason into the PA booth for like a couple innings just to announce the next batter. And I, I just thought that was the coolest thing. Um, so once I, once I kind of found that, it's funny because I've never analyzed that timeline before, but that was probably really my freshman, sophomore year of high school where that solidified itself as, as a genuine passion in my life. And then writing came in pretty quickly after that. It was always something I was good at and I enjoyed, uh, you know, give me the essay portion of anything all day. And so I thought, you know, I'll, I'll be a writer or I'll be a traveling photojournalist. And then I got involved with your book and, and did all these other little odds and ends. Um, and then by the time I graduated and went on to college, I felt that I was able to be myself a little more. Um, it's hard being in a, a median sized small town. You know, you, you kind of get stuck in the box that everybody else wants to put you in. And as a kid, you don't really understand that you can take yourself out of it. Um, so moving away and going to a school where literally no one from my county had, had gone to, uh, I got to be me and had an advisor who, for whatever reason, said, you know, I think I want to switch you from print to broadcast. And this was, you know, my incoming freshman year when you declare your major and all that. And uh, I, I said, okay, you know, I'm the military and the educator kid. So if I'm getting commands from an adult who knows more <laughs> than me, it's okay. Okay. Like you, you know. Um, and from there, I just, I fell in love with it all the more. And every time, you know, it, it changed from, me, okay, will you will you do studio work? Yeah, okay, and then I kind of like it. And will you do live work? Then, all right, and then I loved it. Um, and it's just it's grown from there. I, I feel so lucky. Yeah, it's so interesting. I very much relate to the way that baseball kind of helped form social circles even. I was such a shy kid, didn't always have a great way to to relate to people or communicate with people. And one of the things I loved the most about getting to know the sport of baseball so well is that I could talk to anyone anywhere 
once we started talking baseball, I was like, okay, I got this. I can, this is a thing that I can do. This is a way that I can, you know, relate to people and talk to them about it. I was also the essay person. Um, I, one time in college, I actually had a class where we had to write group essays on a test. It was like everyone, I was always just like, let me write this. And then you can all just say that it's fine. Right. That okay. was <laughs> Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. Uh, so I relate to a lot of what you're saying there. And then actually, even to the, the college experience, I was strictly there to be a writer. I was too shy and I was too afraid of people to do anything more public. And at one point, I was kind of roped into being part of a sports cast that I had no business being part of at the moment. And then it was kind of like the lights came on with that camera and doing something live. And I was like, whoa, that was the adrenaline rush I didn't know I wanted yeah. and kind of snowballed from there. Um, you've done a lot of things, whether it's different sports or things that are very outside the box, like axe throwing and, you know, cornhole and things that you probably didn't think you would be doing when you were pursuing this in college. What was that like? Was it like you do this and then this comes up and then this comes up? Or was it one of those things where you were just kind of like, sure, I'll do anything. <laughs> It's funny, um, because when I first graduated college, everybody was preaching, you know, be a multi-sport journalist, like really, really make yourself as marketable as possible. Look at news stations, look at all this other stuff. And I tell a lot of the kids I mentor now, I'm like, don't do what I did. Like a pursue station work, news stations can still be a viable path into live broadcasting. Like, you know, but I didn't have anybody to tell me that. I thought to be in live broadcasting, you had to find entry-level jobs into live broadcasting, which as we know, there are almost none. Um, but so I, I initially went out and thought, you know, I'll cover anything. And, and I was lucky because I was involved in almost every sport we had on campus. But sitting down with uh, one of my mentors, Bob Rathbun, he said, look, baseball's your thing, you know, and then if you have an opportunity that comes your way, take it, but you need to specialize in baseball. So I said, okay, well, I'll do that. And a couple years later, it was 2016 at this point. Um, I didn't have a job for that season in broadcasting. I did get lucky that because of my work with the statistics department in New York with Major League Baseball, um, it still kept me engaged. You know, it kept me going to a ballpark in the press box, still being around people, even though it wasn't actual broadcasting work, it paid the bills. And had the fortune of, of getting to hook up with the ACC network and calling stuff for the Atlantic Coast Conference. And it started because they had to move everything out of North Carolina that year uh, with the whole bathroom bill scandal debate. Mm. Um, so they moved tennis to Georgia. It was probably 40 minutes from my house. And one of my mentors knew one of the producers and they all of a sudden were in a scramble to replace their sideline reporter. And he said, oh, I've got someone. And, and, they, and so they connected and said, oh, you know, do you, do you cover tennis? I'm like, yeah. No, <laughs> like I used to play. So I, I understood, you know, the basis of the sport uh, and I had seven days. So I, I was watching every broadcast that I could find. And I'm so, I'm so lucky we're growing up when we are with all this technology, because yeah. had this been 30 years ago, we don't have a resource. <laughs> we're we're kind of calling people asking if they have like a VHS tape of a, of a game. And, and instead I just get to YouTube, you know, tennis championship and five different archive broadcasts pull up. Right. Um, and so paying attention to the questions they asked and the lingo they used. And, and so I, it turns out they liked me enough on those three days of tennis that they turned around and said, okay, well now we have track and field in three weeks. Do you, can we, can we use you for track and field? I'm like, what am I like, you ran fast. Like, what am I <laughs> What am I supposed to have there? Like, I don't know. I had you one feel like very, you could have run faster. <laughs> like, yeah, I had one very forgettable track here in high school. Um, like I didn't, I shouldn't have even been in the team photo. That's how bad I was. Uh, so I thought, you know, all right, well, we'll just rinse and repeat. Cool. Just forget everything you just learned about the sport. Now let's take on this other one. Um, and they liked that. And so they said, okay, well now we want to add you on to swimming, but don't worry. It's not until next February. Like, all right, so I have, I have like 10 months. This is, this is doable. Like, I can do this. Um, and then got very lucky that those three sports became a staple for me for, for the past four years. And so those did get easier. So while it was, it was like a combo almost of being like, hey, I'm open for anything. But at the same time, they were, you know, single events where I was like, hey, can, you know, this is the date. Can you do this sport? This is the date. Can you do this sport? The same thing. Um, the producer who used me for axe throwing, it was actually through Raycom Media, but it's broadcast by ESPN. 
uh, Tom Cavanaugh, he and I worked together in college baseball. So I always thought, you know, if that opportunity would be college baseball or college football, it's what we talked about. And then all of a sudden he came back to me after I told him, you know, this one event wouldn't work. He said, oh, I've got ax growing on, uh, in Canada in March. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, okay. but then he's like, yeah, this is what it pays. I was like, uh, yeah, I'll, you can, I'll be the target. I don't care. Like <laughs> I, I, that, that's a big bill pay for me. So yeah, yeah like I'll do it. And I got dropped off and it's 10 degrees in Halifax. And my phone doesn't work and there's no Uber. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is new. Um, but again, just like sitting down and, and watching whatever I could find. And then that led to him being like, they love you on Axe Throwing. Can we add you to Cornhole? I'm like, this is where we're, okay, this is good. But they're all, they're all just awesome. You know, and that's the cool thing, honestly, is getting into these more obscure sports that are finding these new platforms now. They're so much fun. And not because there's like, there's no rules, but at the same time, that's kind of the half of it is they don't, they don't know, you know, what does or doesn't work for broadcasting those sports yet. So you get to be a little creative and experimental and, you know, can we talk about this or how should we approach this angle? Um, so I've actually had a lot of fun digging into the other sports that I, I never thought I would cover or would be capable of covering. Yeah, it's such an interesting challenge and balance, I think. You mentioned, you know, even your mentor saying you need to specialize in baseball because that's what you do and kind of not wanting to get too far away from that or get too involved in something that would take you in a different direction, but also feeling like you need to not only keep working to pay the bills, but also yeah. <laughs> continue to improve what you're doing to be ready for an opportunity in what it is that you want to do. That's such a difficult balance. It's such a difficult challenge. And you know, you said you tell students now, don't do what I did. I've, I've said the same thing because I kind of, the school that I went to uh, was small enough that I had a great opportunity to do all the pieces, right? I could do everything behind the scenes. I could do everything in front of the camera as well. And when I graduated, I was in a position where I could take on any of those roles on any broadcast, which made me very hireable. <laughs> it didn't necessarily help me narrow my focus to kind of stay in my lane. It was like, I can do all these things. So why don't I do all those things so that I can get paid? Yeah. But then you're doing too many things and not focusing. And it's so hard to find that balance and find ways to stay close enough to where you want to be that you can get back there easily, which it seems like you did. I, I feel really fortunate. Um, and, and it did get a little hectic at times and, and it got to the point too where it is frustrating because you know, you're not making a lot of money in minor leagues. Um, but there would be some of those offers to do those sports that the money was so great, but I knew at the end of the day, like there was no way I could make it work with my schedule. And even last year at Salem, um, I mean, there were some times where it was a really tough stretch for me to get through, but the, the fact of the matter was I had already agreed to those commitments before I had the Salem job and I, and they were gracious enough to say, Hey, you know, we are hiring you, but we get it late in the game so you can keep these commitments. You know, we're supportive of that. Uh, but I had a stretch where I literally was on the road with the team, flew out to Des Moines for two days of ax throwing. I think I slept four hours in those three days because I was still doing the game notes after the mm. Salem game end and then prepping for the next broadcast in Des Moines and then still sending out tweet updates for Salem and then going, you know, it was just this back and forth. I mean, just yeah. I was like, can I throw an ax before we go live just for like, I've got it. Like I have anxiety <laughs> and I, I need to expend it some way. Um, and then I, I landed on the road with the team again, took an Uber straight to the ball field to call that game was with the team for two days, bus ride back to Salem, call the game. Of course it went into extra innings and then a rain delay. And then it got suspended, got home at two o'clock in the morning, got up at 6 AM, drove in to cover my first football game for Liberty um, checked my phone the whole time I'm on the sidelines to make sure that we didn't clinch to go to the playoffs back in Salem. And that the one day I'm not there is the biggest day, uh, got home at midnight, got back up at 7am for Salem. And of course, like luck lines up, that was the day they clinched, but that, that final day ended. And I was like, I can't, like, I'm done. I can't breathe. But, um, you know, I, I felt lucky that I had all of those opportunities come my way, but you definitely you have to also be aware at the same time, like you said, like you don't want to lose your focus. You don't want to overstretch yourself. And 
uh, you, you have to make a tough call sometimes. Yeah. Not, not the easy path for sure, or the easy choices, I guess, uh, that get oh. you to where you want to go. I want to talk about minor league baseball for a minute because it's such a, a soapbox of mine from the perspective of being an advocate for minor league players. It's just such, it's home for me in so many ways as far as covering a sport and a portion of a sport that I love so much. And of course, now we know officially there will not be a minor league baseball season in 2020, which is it just so, it's, it's frustrating. It's heartbreaking. It's discouraging on so many levels when you look at the landscape of minor league baseball right now. And I don't even know exactly where I'm going with this, except to say that it's something that matters so much to me. And I know it matters to you as well. It's, it will always be my favorite uh, moment from my life. And it's funny because it's, it's like you said, you know, you, you got the news today and, and I think we all knew how to react. And the only analogy I could even come up with is it's like, if you didn't study for one of your tests in college, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to fail this. Like this, this ain't good. <laughs> and you look at the test and you're like, yeah, this, I'm going to fail this. But like, you still kind of have hope until it gets slapped in front of your face. And there's the giant red F. Like, I think we all knew the reality of getting to have a minor league season this year uh, and, and where that was going, but for it to finally come down. And now you're starting to see the spillover comments about the future of minor league baseball. Um, it, it really does break my heart. Uh, there's such a special place for minor league baseball that does more than major league baseball could ever attempt to do. And the fact of the matter is, is that there's teams in these towns that have been there for over a hundred years, um, in towns that people can't locate on a map. They couldn't tell you what state that place is in, but that team knows where they're at. And, and, you know, these, these owners and the game day employees, the front office employees, I mean, every little person that goes into making those games happen is so underrated. And, and I don't think people truly understand how much of a lifeblood that these teams are to these towns and these cities that have them. And I mean, that goes all the way up to the, to the big ones like Norfolk and Durham. Yeah. Um, who, who, you know, draw the big crowds, but it also goes down all the way, you know, to the little guys, the rookie, the short season teams that get that small little pocket of, you know, 70 odd games to, to make a difference, to give a kid their first summer job, to give a retiree a chance to be out and interacting with people. Um, and that's gone now. And, and it's a huge gap. And you look at the players too, and it's hundreds of athletes who, of course, we've seen they've been getting resourceful. You know, they found a throwing partner, a quarantine buddy that, that they can still stay active with. They've made shreds, sheds, and, and home gyms. And you, you have hope for them that they don't lose a lot in this year. And I certainly feel for the minor league free agents and those guys who are in a much tougher situation. Um, but you, you can't help but hurt a little bit. And I just I can't keep pushing enough that people need to be Two, twofold, visiting these minor league websites and buying from their team shop because that really does directly go to that minor league team that really does help keep them afloat. But also looking at all these amazing resources that have been created to adopt minor league players. Um, I know our baseball life and adopt a minor leaguer are probably the two biggest ones right now. But I mean, doing everything we can to save such a grassroots sport, it's, it's imperative right now. It's so, it's hard for me to talk about this without getting really worked up about it because it's just mind boggling to me that baseball as a whole is so short sighted in the way that they handle really the roots of their product, right? This is where you're generating fans. It's where you're generating players. It's where you're generating people who cover the sport and work their way up to the, to the major league level, which you know, as well as anyone does. So it's very frustrating to me on that level, but it's so personal to so many people because you're right. I live in a minor league city and this team is so woven into the fabric of what happens in this city in the summer. And not just from a baseball like production business role, but the charity work that they do and the way that the players are involved in the community and all of those pieces of this. So it's not just a little thing that if it goes away, people will be like, Oh, remember when that thing happened? Yeah, that was cool. Once it's so much more, ingrained in, in what people do. And then just, you know, from the baseball standpoint, it's such a cool time in the process for these professional athletes, because let me tell you, 
you get a little bit of everything when you're dealing with these minor league players. And some of them come in and are just so wide eyed and have no idea what they walked into. And some of them think that they don't have a care in the world and they're going to just sail right to the big leagues. And there's somebody in the middle all the time that is figuring it out as they go. And it just makes for such an interesting combination of people and such a dynamic with those teams. And it's, they're so fun to be around and watch them learn and watch them progress. It's important on the broadcasting side as well. And I know we talk a lot about the grind that it is for the players, but it is for everyone covering these teams as well. You're not making a lot of money either covering these teams or working in these venues and doing like six different jobs for one salary and trying to get your feet wet in this industry as well. Is there anything about that side of it that you would say, hey, this is what this is what we do that most people don't know? It, um, that's where I always look back and, and I've had people who have said, oh, well, I'm sure like, you know, mommy and daddy paid the way or whatever, but it wasn't the case. You know, I had, I had a family who, when I was 15, they're like, all right, you're getting a job. Like this is done. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the summers in high school. I had a job and, and it was the same too. I, and I joke all the time when I was looking at initially what major I would declare in college, I thought about early elementary education. My mom was an educator for 42 years and you know, I, I did love it. I loved kids. I thought that'd be great. And she said, no, you're not going to do that. You know, it's, it's too long of a commitment. It's 30 years. You know, their teachers are often the second lowest paid professionals in every state. It's like, it's not good pay. So it's like, ha I'll one up you and I'll become a broadcaster and it's less pay and it's less stable. And it's, you know, like hooks, jokes on all of us. Um, but as much of a grind as the minor leagues are. And that's what I tell people all the time is, and I've heard it from a lot of people that I've mentored. They said, well, I only want to be a broadcaster and they want, they want me to be a salesperson. They want me to do this. I said, look, you take it or you don't. Um, I've, I've held down being the salesperson, social media, graphics, uh, being the mascot, coordinating all the community events, all of the in-game entertainment, booking all of the national anthem singers, being the on-field host, Finishing that, going into the booth for innings eight and nine, paying out of pocket to be on the road so that I could actually be in the booth for a full game while still getting up at 6 a.m. to make my allotted daily sales calls. Um, you know, you do everything and you, you kill yourself to be in this industry, but it does two things. And one, it asks of you, do you really want to be in this? Do you really want this as much as you think you do? But two, it sharpens your love and appreciation for what it takes for this game to happen tenfold because you see everything behind the scenes. You see, you know, the bus drivers who have backward sleep schedules so that they can take the team overnight to get to their next place and the clubbies who go through everything to try to bring in nutrition under X, Y, and Z budget planning and um, staying up late and doing all the laundry, which like you could not pay me to do 40 <laughs> athletes laundry. Like it's not happening. Um, but it, it just, it's such a special and unique time. And it was always funny to me because without naming anybody, like we had a, we had a manager and he knew I made about half of the lowest minor league athlete salary. Uh, so, you know, they would complain and he'd, he'd like get on the microphone on the bus and he'd be like, Hey Mel, I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. And he's like, how much are you making right now? It's like, why, why do we have to do this? But just kind of like show the guys, like you don't have it as bad as she does. And I, and I've told them too, because you know, they'd rib me about it. And even this year, um, I got really close to the Salem team. So we had some not great hotels where I would have to like sit in the hallway and find a spot where I could actually get any type of Wi-Fi signal from the hotel so I could send out the game recap. And it's already one o'clock in the morning. No one's probably up to read this thing, but like, it's got to go out. And they'd walk outside and they'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> and you know, they, and, and so they're like, dude, nobody gets it. You know, you're up until two or three in the morning and then you get up at eight and you're doing all sorts of stuff. I said, look, yes, the hours are taxing and it's a lot on me mentally sometimes, but I can't go out there and do what you do. I can't, I can't make plays the way that you do. I can't put a ball in play to save my life. I mean, I can barely swing a bat sometimes, depending on if I've been in the gym or not. So I'm hopeless now. But, um, you know, like what, what we do, it, it's a sacrifice, yes. But at the end of the day, it's to cover something that's so spectacularly hard for the average person to even be capable of doing. And it's all those little moments and what makes them who they are as a human being that wraps into who they are as an athlete 
like, yeah, we're going to, we're going to take all of that with it. And, and the intimacy and the, the level of just true grit that you only get at the minor league end, um, it's invaluable. And, and I almost wish to a degree, if everybody went through one season of minor league ball, I think a whole country would be a lot better off. Cause they'd be like, all right, like I got this. Yeah. I often tell people that the things that have made me the best at my job when I'm doing what it is that I want to be doing, whether it's on camera or whether it's on a podcast or whether it's whatever it is, the things that I had to do to get there are the things that make me good at my job because I know what's going on behind the scenes. I know what it takes to get everything working how it needs to be working to pull it all off. And I think that's the same uh, idea as, you know, the actual construction of how a game and a season comes together on the minor league level that just makes you understand so much more about how it all happens that then when you get to tell those stories, there's so much more context and so much more depth to what it is that you're able to tell. And then when you get a chance to finally call that major league game at spring training, Let's get to that point. That is that is the dream job. You got that call. If you want to share any of that process of, of how you were able to make that connection, what it was like when you thought it might be happening, it might not be happening, you weren't sure yet, then you get the call that it is, and all of a sudden, there you are at spring training. It's, you know, I had people for so long who told me, especially when things were hard, like just hold on for now, because at some point in your life, you're going to be having multiple people who are knocking on your door and you're going to have to make a decision. I was like, yeah, okay. Like I'm, I'm trying to get one person to knock. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's all I really need at the end of the day. Um, I had all my sights set on going back to Salem this year. There were a couple opportunities that I was fleshing out trying to see if they would come to fruition in the fall. Um, and it seemed at the time that they weren't going to, it was probably by Thanksgiving. I was pretty sure, you know, okay, Salem's where I'm going back to. And very grateful for that because that was the first minor league team I've ever been a part of who made it very open that this was not a, a per year basis. This was, we love you. You're a part of this family. We think the message you bring in the way that you carry this fits perfectly. And we want you here as, as long as you can stay here. Um, so I was very fortunate for that and excited, you know, for the first year in ever, I didn't have to spend my off season looking for a job. <laughs> um, and, and very late January got a phone call and it just said, you know, Hey, we just want to chat and, and see how you're feeling about baseball, what your ideas are when it comes to broadcasting and the content and everything else. Um, so we talked for a little bit and maybe two, three days later it was, Hey, you know, can we, can we fly up here? I thought, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. So <laughs> sure, I got on a plane, I want to say within 36 hours, um, early morning flight up, late night flight back. And it was just conversations all day. You know, there was never any concrete, well, we're hiring for this, or this is what we're doing here. And it was very different from all the other major league interviews I had, because I'd had about a dozen going into this one. Um, so I thought I knew what to expect. And, and thank God I've been kind of taught, you know, you always keep an open head about stuff because the minute you put it in a box is when you get thrown on your feet and it's the opposite. Um, so I, I didn't even know, you know, and my family was like, Oh, was it a job offer? Is it this? And I was like, I don't know. And like, how do you not know? So I, don't, I don't know. Like, is it, we hung out and had a conversation and I didn't have to pay for the flight. So we'll just look at it like that. You know, it's a good opportunity either way. Um, and then thought, okay, maybe there's a possibility for, for a handful of games, you know, to come in and, and fill in, for them or, or to do something. And I knew again, with the way Salem worked with me last year, they'll be flexible with that. It'll be a stretch, but you've already kind of stretched yourself last year. Like we know that, that you can pull that out. Um, and when they came back, it, it shocked me, uh, to, to see the actual details of it and that it would be a full time opportunity to just really be a part of the Orioles to, to constantly give content to fans in multiple different ways. And again, not having to choose. To, to be in the booth and the sidelines and combine the two things that I love the most and explore any opportunity outside of that with them as well. Um, it was a dream. And I, and you always picture in your head, like what that moment's going to be like. So I always thought like, Oh, it'll be this one team and, and they'll call me and, and maybe I'll like, I'll, I'll hold it together on the phone and I'll just say yes. And then I get to be emotional after and tell all my family and friends and, and we'll have a party and we'll do this other stuff. But I was actually, also trying to navigate a different team at that time. 
Um, mm. So I couldn't react right away. And I didn't, having had my family go through this process with me for so long, and it's funny because I had already been trained to temper my reaction, to not get my hopes up that just because someone was interviewing me, that doesn't mean they're going to say yes. Um, and so what was hard with them was every time it was a big interview, they were getting their hopes up. And, and it was probably like, she's finally going to move out of the house. Like, <laughs> she's finally, you know, whatever. Um, so I just didn't tell them anything. And then especially when it came to the fact that we were balancing two different teams at the same time, I was like, okay, now we're definitely not telling them anything. They knew I had meetings and interviews and stuff like that, but I just kept saying, you know, there's, there's really nothing there. I knew when Baltimore came back and seeing that it was a chance to join them full time, I knew that that was my answer. Um, and that's what I wanted to do, but you still have to be uh, respectful and cordial. Um, you certainly don't want to burn any bridges. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I had those other opportunities, you know, that I, I don't want any bad feelings um, towards those other people because they're people that still believed in me. Yeah. And, and so I had to sit on it after I had said yes to Baltimore for days <laughs> until we had finally sorted everything out. Uh, my agent, Rick Diamond was so great at just kind of helping me navigate the waters and this is when you can say certain things like to the point of where I didn't know when I needed to tell Salem, I wasn't going to be back for 2020. Mm, yeah. Uh, so it's finally this big relief off my chest. And I told my, my family while we were playing a word game, it's called Bananagram. So it's like Scrabble, but without the board. My and, family and loves I, that game. I love that game. Um, yeah. I can't my annoyed some of my other family with it. Because <laughs> I'm like, I will brag. That's the one thing I'm good at in life is that game. Um, but we always go over like the biggest spelled words that we had after every round. So I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Like, I'm going to lose a round and then be like, Oh, like I, I got a big league job and I didn't win just to like see. So I, I lose a round and, and I said that, and my sister looked up at me and she was like, no one else caught it. They're all looking at my board, trying to like check it for accuracy. And I'm like, I didn't even win. Why are you, why are you actually <laughs> my board? Also, those are like four words I just strung together. Like, I can't even play that together. I was like, seriously, this is not what I pictured for this moment. Um, and then her husband looked up at me too. And he's like, you, you really got a big league job. And then I think my parents kind of slowed down, but it still took like everybody a minute. And then it wasn't even like, you know, the jubilation that you think it's going to be. They're all like, are you serious? So like, when did you, when did you know? Like, what's the details? I'm like, All right, whatever. I give up. Like, I'm not. This is why I'm not a screenwriter because I just I just can't draft up moments. It's fine. Um, but after that, and after you know, they found out what exactly was going on and stuff, and we could start putting stuff together. Um, it didn't leave me a lot of time, but it's still in light the fact that I was getting to move into a role that you know I've I've dreamed about for the last decade. Um. And had finally, I think the biggest part was come into acceptance that I needed to stop pushing for when is it going to happen and why hasn't it happened, but just, you know, it'll happen. And if it doesn't, I love minor league baseball and that's okay too. And it was kind of like the minute that I let go of all that was when everything allowed itself to fall into place. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I understand, you know, people not reacting like you expect them to, but I will tell you, um, my reaction when I heard you calling the spring training game, which was so cool. I was in my car listening to you calling the game. And the only thing that I can really compare it to, I don't, I don't know if you're a big fan of the Marvel movies. Um, but there's this scene in the last one in, in end game and the big, big battle scene, all of the, the female characters kind of have this moment and there, there's not a lot of dialogue. It's just like they all show up and are a part of this one moment. And I didn't expect that to get to me when I was watching this movie. And all of a sudden I was like, I, like tears. And I was like, what is happening? I did not expect that at all. I don't usually react like that. That was how I reacted when I was listening to you call a spring training game oh game because God. it was just like, this is real and it's happening. And there are so many opportunities like that now for people who didn't always have those opportunities to be that voice and to, to have someone across the country or in the backyard of that, that ballpark hear someone that they feel like, Hey, I could do that someday. And, um, so maybe your family didn't react like you wanted them to, but maybe that makes up for it a little bit. That was my moment. <laughs> <laughs> That, that means everything to me. Um, I actually, I haven't asked my family about 
that that day of getting to be on air, I did get so my my boyfriend's mom and she's a, a huge fan of a different AL East team. Okay, um, but that was when I knew it was a good thing because she was like, I tuned in, um, and and I know she knows her stuff. So I was like, oh gosh, and she was like, it's great. <laughs> It's like, oh, okay, so this is this is a good thing. Um, and knowing that she gave up watching her her other beloved team to see that was was really a cool moment for me. And and I I loved the feedback too because what what people don't know about the day is I mean obviously you try to but like I didn't sleep the night before. Um, I was still doing stuff for the stats department and going back and forth between like prepping and learning a new organization. In addition to the fact that like you're not in the minors, <laughs> you're in the big, people are paying attention to what you're saying. Uh, and, and, you know, everything that goes with that, well, I woke up that morning, I had no voice. Mm. Um, allergies were really bad. I felt they had kind of keeled out the last couple of days. And then all of a sudden I just had nothing. And I was like, I don't like, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to go on air like this. And, and lucky for me, Jeff Arnold and I have worked together all last year in the Carolina League. So we've been on air together several times. He's, he's become a very close friend of mine. He analyzes a lot of my on-air work. Um, and I told him, I said, look, I'm, you're, you're going to have to help me today. And I already knew he'd have to help me because it was my first game and all the anxiety that goes with that. Um, and he's like, all right. He's like, all right, I got you. And then we are going in. I thought, I'm going to get to the ballpark early. I'm going to prep. I'll, I'll finish my notes. It'll be this, that, and the other. And then it's like, hey, okay, so we're going to actually have you in the media scrum after Brandon Hyde. I'm like, oh. So then, you know, I, I sit down and, and answer all these questions, which was such an honor and a privilege to, to have Baltimore give that call to attention to that mile marker in their history when they certainly didn't have to at all. Um, and it just goes to, to that whole Baltimore staff, all of the writers and the broadcasters. I really feel like even though there's so many of us, they're all so kind and, and welcoming. I mean, they really do feel like family. And so we're, we're going through the day and now I've gotten this, and now I'm trying to go back to prepping. I'm like, Hey, so we're going to have a visitor in the booth in the third inning. That's my first inning. And I was like, Hey, it's good. Uh, so it was just like, it was like one thing after another, after another. And I even remember like we, we had a home run call and first big league home run call, like, you know, great. But because of my voice, I couldn't elevate the way that I usually do <laughs> because I could feel, I could feel the cough attack coming in. So I, I kind of squeaked it out like this low, mellow home run call. And I mean, I abused my mute button that day. It was so bad. And, and thank God for Jeff because he would just sweep right in and, and you know, he'd start <laughs> filling in and, and painting all the pictures until I was done and I could unmute myself. Um, so we've, we've talked about it a lot, you know, what, what's it going to be like to finally get back in and, and to now have to get all of the other rust off and, and go through the nerves almost all over again. Um, but it, it was just, it was such a lucky day and, and to see my friends react to it and the people who sent screenshots of like, you know, listening on their phone and stuff. Um, it was that moment of like, I've, I've done right by, by everybody who supported me this whole time. And, and that's probably the biggest thing is, is giving back and properly representing the whole network of the village of people who have who have rooted me on the entire time well it's very well deserved and I'm excited to see what does come of this season and and the opportunities that you have there as well I don't want to take up too much more of your time so I will just leave it with this and ask you what are you most looking forward to after this crazy run of events in 2020 if we actually make it to opening day <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm going to be a little of an overachiever here. I just, whenever it happens and obviously we're the way we're reading 2020, it may be 2021, but I'm still looking forward to having that first real moment of walking into a packed Camden yards and seeing all the fans and the little kids and these new generations of, of baseball lovers who are pouring into the stadium and you smell baseball and you hear baseball, but having a real game back. Is, the, is that one thing? Because everybody, you know, they were like, do you feel like you're in the big leagues yet? And I was like, well, I mean, kind of. There's moments where it hits me. But, like, I've, I've worked spring training for seven years. Spring training is a normal event for me. So it doesn't feel weird or different, even though, yes, it's in the booth and I haven't gotten to do that aspect of it yet. Um, so I was like, yeah, so March 26th when it's the Yankees and they're standing across the way and Camden's packed out and Susan's up in the booth and – 
you know, that's when it'll feel real. And then it was like, all right, so that's, <laughs> not, that's not here still. Um, I'm curious to see what feelings this year brings, but I'm just, that's the one I'm looking forward to is, is a normal baseball game. Just bringing back the best of it. I think, we're all looking forward to that, maybe for different reasons, but nonetheless, looking forward to a little bit of normal and a lot more baseball. Melanie, thank you so much. This was so much fun. I feel like we could talk forever, but I won't take up anybody, anybody else's time any further than we already have. <laughs> <laughs> we can just, we'll make it a week long segment. It's fine. Perfect. Perfect. We'll just, I, you know, <laughs> it's not like you're going to have anything else to do now that baseball's back, right? <laughs> no, not at all. There's, there's no prep work to do for that. Yeah, no, no. Well, enjoy every bit of it and we'll do this again sometime then. <laughs> Perfect. Seriously though, that end game moment that I was talking about? Don't worry. She's got health. Chills every time. Which is actually how I reacted to hearing Melanie on the radio calling that Orioles spring training game. I'm so excited to hear her call many more games for the Orioles as she moves throughout this new phase of her career in her dream job. Thanks again to Melanie for joining me to tell me all of those stories. I'm sure there are plenty more if we were to ever talk again, but you got just a little taste of what it's like to go from not even knowing you wanted to work in television to being on air as a voice and face for a Major League Baseball team. Pretty cool if you ask me. And you didn't, but you're watching my video, so I get to answer anyway. <laughs> If there are any other questions you want me to answer or you want my next guest to answer about working in sports or about being on camera or behind the camera or what it takes to get into a college with a major that you're not totally sure about or any of the pieces of that process, please leave those comments in the question box below and I will answer them or I'll get someone else to answer them and we can share in that conversation together because that is why we are all here is to share and to communicate and to talk about sports and the things that we love and to make the world feel a little less lonely. If you like this video and want more content like this or any of the other videos you've seen on this channel, don't forget to subscribe and turn on that notification bell so you will find out every time I post a new video and we should all do this again sometime. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Tara Wellman. I'll see you then.